This is our second lecture about atheism. And in this lecture, I'd like to focus on the deductive arguments for the non-existence of God and a broader argument based on a metaphor about perpetual motion machines that I'm going to add at the end. So we've already seen that there's two different families of arguments for atheism, inductive and deductive. Let's consider how the general structure of the deductive arguments works. These arguments are for the conclusion that God is in effect impossible, logically impossible. Now how would you argue for something like that? Well, the standard conception of God is having the big five properties, the omni God, is that there's one of them, he's personal, he's all-powerful, he's all-knowing, he's all-good. Many authors uh, some of which are included in the volume here, the edited by Martin and Monier, The Impossibility of God. Uh, many authors have argued that some of the classic properties, the essential properties like omnipotence or omniscience, are, are, are incoherent or impossible. There's something uh, uh, logically contradictory about the property the same way a married bachelor would be logically contradictory. Now some of these arguments get very technical and we're getting far out into the woods in the philosophical literature, but I do want you to know that this discussion is uh, going on out there and that philosophers are trying to come up with a good, clear, coherent account of omnipotence. And some authors have insisted that, no, that there is no such thing. There can be no such thing because it makes no more sense than a triangle with four sides. Another uh, family of arguments that builds on this sort of notion is arguments that combine properties. So uh, God is alleged to be perfect and the creator, immutable and the creator. He's alleged to be non-physical and personal or omnipresent and conscious or justice, have infinite justice and mercy and so on. And many authors like uh, Theodore Drange, uh, I have an article in this volume and lots of other authors have said these pairs, some of these pairs pairs of properties don't make sense when they're combined together so that means that some being if there is one out there could either be one or the other but not both and if it turns out that God in order to be God needs to have both then that means that means that God's impossible or that we have to go back to the drawing board and figure out just what exactly is God like if he's not this or he's not that so it's forced us to radically reconceive of what sort of being is possible over the centuries Okay, now the major objection that gets lodged, at least by non-philosophers, against the atheistic position is the so-called you can't prove a negative problem. Uh, and the idea here is that how could you possibly know that there's no God? You might be wrong. There might be a sound argument for God's existence that's forthcoming. Or maybe we haven't looked in the right sorts of places. You can't prove that there's no God. You can't settle this question. So how could you possibly be justified in saying there isn't one? Or in particular, if we're considering wide atheism, how could you possibly conclude that there are no gods whatsoever? At the very most, what you've done is you've shown that some descriptions of God don't make some sense uh, internally, but that doesn't mean there's none at all. And people have also argued, well, look, the absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence. And that's to say that the mere fact that we don't have compelling evidence in hand doesn't mean that there's no such thing out there. If God's not the sort of thing that can be rendered in terms of evidence or is not, not the sort of thing that's manifest in the ways in which we're looking, then you wouldn't expect to find uh, that kind of evidence out there. So the failure to find that evidence doesn't mean that there's not one of them out there. It's a, it's a non sequitur to go to the conclusion there is no such thing. Maybe God is just something completely inaccessible to us or unknowable to us. He's too vast. He's too infinite beyond our finite nature. We have limits. We haven't looked everywhere. And this is like the dilemma when you've lost your keys. Uh, where did I leave my keys? Once I've looked everywhere I can think, maybe I conclude there is no such thing. You wouldn't do that in that case. You think your keys are somewhere. You just can't figure out where they are. So you're not justified in, in concluding the negative existential claim. Okay, now there's a fallacy lurking here that Stephen Law has called going nuclear. 
And to understand the fallacy and why it's wrong, we need a little bit of background here. During the Cold War in the 1950s and 60s between the Soviet Union and the United States, uh, when we had this escalation, this buildup of nuclear weapons, our strategy for winning was a peculiar one because we weren't going to win. The strategy was to resort to an option that would lay waste to everything. The strategy, because we had so many nuclear weapons and because they had so many nuclear weapons, the strategy was, well, maybe we can't win the war, we can't come out the victors, but we're willing to start a global thermonuclear war in order to destroy all life on Earth just to make sure that you don't win the war. So it's not like we're going to win, we're just going to make sure you don't you don't win. We prevent that from happening by wiping the slate clean of everybody. And this is a very scary time and it was it was called by lots of people a completely insane strategy. Uh, by some accounts it worked. We avoided uh, global thermonuclear ap apocalypse but people were really worried for a long time because we had so much capacity to ruin everything. Now that's the point here about the objection to atheism and the allegation that you can't uh, prove atheism. So let's call it global thermonuclear skepticism. This is the skeptic who says, well, you can't prove that there's no God. You can't prove there's no God because we can't prove anything. There's nothing that we can know with complete certainty, so there's nothing we know. That is, if you don't know anything, then we certainly don't know there's no God. Or alternately, somebody might say there's nothing that we can know with certainty, so it's okay for me to go ahead and believe in God or whatever else I want. All right, so there's a number of responses that the atheist should make here. First, global skepticism of the sort that's been brought up isn't uniquely the atheist's problem to solve. If global skepticism is right, and I don't think it is, then it undermines everybody, including the skeptic, on everything. Atheism can't be singled out as uniquely irrational because it fails to solve an unsolvable problem. There's a kind of double standard here. Or the critic has elevated the standard of proof to this artificially high level that can't be met by anything and then said to the atheist, well, you can't do this, so you're not justified or you're not being reasonable. Uh, it's a it's a it's an unfair the bar has been raised to an unfair level. And let me show you why. Uh, here's a couple of different ways this can pan out. So the critic might say, well, we can't know anything, so it's okay for me to go ahead and indulge in my religious beliefs. Now this critic certainly can't say it's wrong for the atheist to think there's no God, because this atheist himself has, uh, has, has decided to go ahead. So it's as if he's leveling the playing field, or it's as if he's opened the floodgates. The problem now appears to be that since we can't know anything, then there's no standard by which for us to judge these claims about the ultimate reality of things. So everything comes through. What's to keep somebody from saying, well, you can't know anything, so I'm going to go ahead and believe in atheism. I'm going to believe in the purple absolute. I'm going to believe in the great pumpkin. I'm going to believe in Allah. I'm going to believe in Gef June. And since we can't know anything, you can't tell me not to. You can't give me any solid reasons for not accepting that. So in effect we've got um, total belief anarchy, we've got a free-for-all regarding gods. So if that's what the critic's got in mind, he's got the floodgate problem and surely he doesn't want to say that anything goes because of this so-called you can't prove anything problem. That's a mistake. Now another way to understand the, the way the critic might go is the critic might be saying, well, we can't know anything, so theists and atheists are both wrong for alleging to know that which cannot be known. So this guy's setting the bar of proof really, really high and then demanding of everybody that they suspend judgment or they back off of these claims. But look, this produces nihilism, it stultifies us, it, complete, it produces complete gridlock this global skeptic has thrown up his hands, we have to suspend judgment about everything now. That's to say, take all of the, the vast class of things that we thought we knew, normal things like 2 plus 2 equals 4, or these are my hands, or uh, smoking causes cancer, or today is Tuesday, or 
any of the other ordinary common sense beliefs that you completely take for granted and then in another circumstance you would take them to be known you'd say well we know that the Washington Monument is 555 feet tall well now this skeptic has elevated the standard of what can be known to the point that we have to give up all of those claims and we can't say that we know them anymore now famously GE Moore rejected this kind of move and he said, look, if your standards for knowledge are so high that they have the result that we don't know anything, well, then it's the standards that are messed up. It's not our attempt to know things that are wrong. The problem here is not the, is not the thing we're trying to measure. The problem is the measuring stick. If you're going to insist that knowledge is something that we only have when we have absolute complete deductive certainty 100 percent guarantee in incorrigible uh, conclusive evidence for well then that means we don't know anything and GE Moore said well that's crazy because there's far more things we know than that so Moore flipped this thing around and said whatever kind of a reasonable standard of knowledge we're going to adopt it can't be that crazy it can't be that demanding we need a different account of knowledge because there are in fact some things we don't know and I think the atheist in this case is free to make this objection back to the uh, you can't prove a negative critic and say the only way that your criticism against atheism can get traction is if, is if you lay waste to everything, is if you bomb the entire planet and make sure nobody wins. And that's obviously a crazy outcome. You've just uh, uh, stricken the word no from the English, English language. So the, the t throwing the baby out, of, out with the bathwater, if you will, mixing the metaphors. But it's even much worse because we don't know anything in this case. All right, so another reason to reject the uh, proving the negative objection. And finally, this happens sometimes. Sometimes the critic will say, well, you can't prove there's no God. However, I still believe there is a God. Maybe I have some special knowledge that God is real. Okay, now wait a minute. There's something fishy going on here. There's a weird sort of double standard here. How did this critic or this theist get a free pass on the global skepticism problem? How is it if you can't prove anything or know anything that she's got some special free pass about knowing that God's real? This knife, if you're going to pull it out, cuts both ways. You don't get to both say, I know that God exists and you can't prove anything is true. You don't, you're no longer entitled to say that I'm justified or legitimate or it's okay for me to believe this thing because I've got some special access. Now the more general problem here is the one that I've alluded to with some of these deductive atheology arguments is that there's a whole formidable literature here, a long tradition in philosophical uh, philosophy of religion of articles and books that argue that God's existence is logically deductively 100% impossible. That is, these are arguments alleged to do exactly what this critic says you can't do. These arguments are showing that God is impossible. And if God is logically impossible, then we've got, even by the higher standard, what this critic was saying you can't get. We've got arguments that show um, that there cannot be a God like that. We know there cannot be a married bachelor or a four-sided triangle. And similarly, say these are uh, authors, we know that there cannot be a God because omnipotence is impossible, because omniscience is impossible, because infinite justice and mercy are impossible, and so on. Now maybe there are other problems with those arguments, but this critic at least has to face the fact that those arguments have been made and can't just dismiss them without considering real arguments that allege to do the thing that the critic denied was even possible. Okay, now another important distinction, we need to distinguish between dogmatism and defeasible beliefs. To be dogmatic about something is to believe rigidly, without interest or care about the evidence, and with no willingness to revise under any circumstances. And I think in many circumstances, when the atheist, certainly the wide positive atheist, says something like, well, there's no gods, many people's suspicion and many people's objection is that this guy seems to think that 
he's settled this question beyond all doubt and there can be no more discussion and he's utterly unreceptive to any openness or he's utterly unwilling to consider any of the possible uh, problems or doubts or possibilities that might undermine the argument. And I think they'd be right that if there is a dogmatic uh, atheist out there, dogmatism is the problem. There's certainly dogmatic religious folks out there, and dogmatism is is the uh, enemy of sound, thoughtful reason in both circumstances. Dogmatism is a mistake in both instances. Um, by contrast, defeasibility is what we're after. The reasonable person, the thoughtful person, is one who has defeasible beliefs. And a defeasible belief is one that you're prepared to change in the light of new evidence. So somebody might conclude, for instance, on the basis of good evidence, that there are no dodo birds. The dodo bird is extinct. But if some anthropologist captures one in the jungles of Madagascar, now decades after we thought they were gone, and we really figured out it was a dodo bird, now we maybe should revise our information. We should change our mind about that. So what's wrong with saying provisionally at the outset, there are no dodo birds. The dodo bird is no longer on the planet. And being prepared in the light of new evidence, if the right kind of evidence comes to light, we'd be prepared to change our minds. Now, by a similar case, why can't the atheist similarly, it seems like they ought to be, if they're going to be this, they ought to, be, ought to have defeasible beliefs. They ought not to be dogmatic for the, all the reasons we've considered. So now what about the possibility of a defeasible, wide, positive atheist? Okay, so here's the most ambitious atheist position. And what could it could there be someone be like that and still be open to some possibility that they could be wrong? Okay, so what I want to do here is make sketch out a, an argument by analogy how somebody might hold this view, and there's a number of authors out there who do seem to hold a view like that. Now, do you know what a perpetual motion machine is? Well, perpetual motion machines have been around. The idea of them have been around for centuries, and as far as we understand, if one was real, it would defy physical law. The way a perpetual motion machine works, and the second one here is even one that da Vinci had de designed, and the idea is that they produce more energy than goes into them. That is, you set this machine up, you hit the start button, or you get it going, and it will actually generate more energy than is put into it. So what that would mean is if you've got one of those, is it would, it would be a source of free energy. And this is huge, right? Because if you could have something like this, it would revolutionize life on the planet. You set up a whole bunch of these, you generate free free energy, and everybody gets all of their needs because you know so many of the things we need in the world are, gener are generate or based upon energy. Everybody gets all of their needs met for free. So there's obviously a huge allure to producing one of these things, and lots and lots of people over the centuries have thought they've got a way to do it, and they've gotten sort of seduced by the idea. But here's what's happened now. The US and British patent offices used to accept applications for patents on perpetual motion machines. They used to accept a set of plans. If you drew it up and turned it in, they would diligently sit down with it and look at it and examine it. And they would, their engineers would look at it and see whether or not this is a viable concept and whether or not this deserves a patent as a genuinely new idea that you deserve some sort of intellectual property rights to because you've solved the problem or you've come up with this great idea. But after thousands and thousands and thousands of submissions and examining those submissions carefully and thoroughly and discovering in every one of those cases that they don't work, the US and British patent offices now refuse to take any more applications unless the petitioner can do something new. They want a working model. If you can build one, they will listen to you. But until then, they're done. They're, they're not going to put time, energy, and resources into this project. And I think this is a perfectly reasonable conclusion to draw. It's an inductive conclusion to draw. It's something that they ought to do, given the circumstances. It's time to say, no, no more. However, if someone can do the impossible, what seems to be impossible, and give us a new one, then we'll reconsider. Now, this 
idea, this strategy of argument, ought to apply to lots of other cases. It probably does. This is probably why we don't think alchemy works. This is probably why we don't think evil demons are responsible for disease. Uh, evil demon possession doesn't cause mental illness. This is for. This is probably in outline the same sort of argument that gives us lots of our widespread conclusive uh, positive assertions that there are no such things. Uh, alchemy is impossible, there are no demons, and so on. Now what's to keep the atheist from doing something similar? Why can't this guy say, provisionally, I conclude on the basis of long and careful investigations that there are no such things. And it seems to me that at least there's the possibility of pursuing some kind of line here. This is certainly what a number of authors have done. This is what, in outline, uh, Michael Martin, Richard Gale, Sobel, Smith, Sober, Nielsen, Oppie, Drain, Schellenberg, Findlay, Stenger, uh, I've written on this topic, Nicholas Everett, and a long list of other uh, philosophical uh, authors um, have done, they've argued in outline that this grand outline of an argument does justify us in concluding the strong conclusion and even more strongly deductive atheological arguments raise serious questions about the viability of the God concept alone. And this is perhaps even stronger than the uh, argument against perpetual motion machines. Perpetual motion machines, they, I suppose they might be naturally possible because we don't really understand all of natural law, but deductive atheological arguments argue that God's impossible on the basis of logic alone. They say logically such a thing can't happen. Not just naturally, but logically such a thing can't happen. So we at least have some arguments in hand that say logically God's impossible and, and uh, naturally God seems to be highly improbable. So on those basis uh, we conclude uh, adding in the numerous inductive of arguments, they undermine the likelihood of God and gods, so provisionally there are no gods. Now this is not to say that this is settled, but there at least is a broad technical description of how some of the atheists in the philosophical literature are making this case, and how all of the other smaller sub-arguments fit within the framework. Okay, in conclusion, we've seen that there is a genre, a subdiscipline in philosophical literature. We're calling it deductive atheology. These authors argue that God is impossible on a variety of single and multiple property disproof arguments. There is an argument out there, an objection to the effect that you can't prove a negative, that somehow proving a negative is impossible or difficult. We've seen one answer possibly to this objection that says, well, the objection here is going nuclear. It elevates proof to a level that undermines everything as we know it, not just God. It's not uniquely the atheist problem to solve. In fact, this undermines lots of things that the objector doesn't want to undermine. They've got way worse problems than the fact that there's no God. If we can't know or prove anything, then the floodgates to belief anarchy are opened, we've undermined the vast majority of things we treat as knowledge, and it undermines the believer's own justification for believing. Atheists, along with everybody else, should have defeasible, not dogmatic beliefs, we've discovered, and we've seen a, an argument by analogy from perpetual motion machines. There comes a point in our investigations into a topic when we can reasonably conclude there are no such things, and that perhaps gives us the conclusion of defeasible wide positive atheism, uh, at least in theory. Therefore, amen.